This is Dr. Martha Faraday. I'm a scientist, a PhD, and an equine nutritionist. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you with everything you need to know if your horse has been diagnosed with equine protozoal myeloencephalitis, or EPM. The first question you may be asking yourself is, well, how did my horse get EPM? So EPM is a parasitic infection by a protozoa. Uh, most commonly, this, those protozoa are S. neurona or N. hugazi, and if you've had a titer done, you may see those names on your titer report specifying which organism that your horse may have. The infectious form of the protozoa is excreted in possum droppings, and the, the horse in, inadvertently ingest these droppings in the grass. It could also be in contaminated hay or feed or even contaminated water. The protozoa are carried by other animals like cats and raccoons and skunks, but only a possum can infect your horse. Um, and it's very important to understand that EPM is not passed from horse to horse. So this is a picture, a diagram showing what I just ex explained. So if you start at the left and you follow those arrows up, you see that there are carrier animals there. So the raccoon, the skunk, the cat, and that organism, though, has to pass through the possum in order to then be transformed in the possum's body and excreted in, in its infective form, which is what then is troubling the horse. So the horse then inadvertently ingests that, and the protozoa enters the horse's body through the gut, and in some horses it then infiltrates the brain and spinal cord, and that's where all the trouble starts. So what happens when your horse ingests the protozoa? This is very important to understand. So when the protozoa entered the gut, the immune system, about two thirds of which is in the gut wall, will start to make antibodies. So this is the body's natural response to an invader. If you happen to, to pull a blood sample at this time and do an EPM titer, you'll find that the horse has a positive titer meaning the horse has been exposed. The protozoa have come into the gut. In areas where EPM is rampant, greater than 90% of horses may have a positive blood titer indicating they've been exposed. But exposure by itself does not cause symptoms. Exposure is not the same thing as infection. And we're gonna come back to this point several times because it's extremely important you understand these two concepts. In some horses, the protozoa will escape the gut, they will cross the blood-brain barrier, and they will enter the brain and spinal cord. At that point, the horse is now considered infected, and by definition, infection means symptoms. So exposure is not the same thing as infection. Infection requires symptoms. So how is EPM diagnosed? It involves the measurement of antibodies to the protozoa. This is the immune system's response. So this is true of any, any blood titer you do for any disease. So with EPM, you're not, you're not measuring the protozoa. You're measuring the immune system's activity and response to the protozoa's presence. So you can measure this in blood, a blood titer. This is most commonly done. It also can be measured in the cerebrospinal fluid this is less commonly done. It's more expensive. It's also invasive. You have to go into um, the, the fluid around the spinal cord in order to do it. Diagnosis critically involves assessment of symptoms. This is a behavioral neurological exam by your veterinarian. There is a formal procedure for doing this. Your veterinarian is trained in how to do this to determine whether your horse's nervous system is impaired and where that might be taking place. In addition, clinically, I find owner observations of other symptoms to be absolutely invaluable because you, you know your horse, you're the expert on your horse, and you are going to know if something seems not right, especially things such as your horse's um, mood change, which may not show up on a behavioral exam. How do we interpret diagnostic information? This is a decision tree. So your horse has symptoms. Your veterinarian has documented these. You have noticed these and has a positive blood titer. 
in that scenario, it's very likely your horse is infected, meaning the protozoa have gotten into the brain and spinal cord. Let's say your horse has symptoms documented by your veterinarian and by your observations, but that blood titer is negative. So if this horse might be infected. The definitive titer in that case would be the cerebrospinal fluid, so the CSF titer, to see are there antibodies around the spinal cord, meaning the protozoa got in there. If the horse has a positive CSF titer with symptoms, the interpretation is the horse is definitely infected. If the horse has a negative CSF titer, meaning there, is, there are no antibodies to protozoa around the spinal cord, then this is probably not EPM. And it's time to look for other symptom causes. This could be arthritis in the spine, particularly in the neck. Uh, it could be kissing spine, wobblers, equine motor neuron disease, or even neurological Lyme, although that's rare. Let's go back to this distinction between exposure versus infection, because holding on to this distinction is extremely important in understanding what happens in recovery and how to interpret events as well as later titers. So again, exposure, horse has ingested the protozoa, the horse is making antibodies because they hit that gut wall and the immune system does what it's supposed to be, be doing. It's supposed to make antibodies to an invader, but the protozoa are not in the brain and spinal cord. This horse will have a positive blood titer, if, if you happen to do a CSF titer, that would be negative because they aren't there. And the horse will have a negative behavioral exam. Your vet won't find anything. And, and you won't have any observations either. Your horse will seem to be normal. In contrast, infection by definition means the protozoa have entered the nervous system. They are replicating in the brain and spinal cord and they are causing symptoms. So infection means symptoms. This horse will have a positive blood titer. If you happen to do a CSF titer, that will be positive as well. There'll be a positive behavioral exam. Your vet will be able to document symptoms and you will have observations that you've made indicating that you know your horse is not well. How do you interpret titer numbers? This is another area of tremendous confusion in understanding how EPM is diagnosed. So, a general principle is if your horse has no symptoms, then that titer only reflects exposure, meaning your horse ate some possum droppings that had protozoa in them. And it does not matter what that number is. So first, horse has no symptoms. That titer number really is absolutely irrelevant. Remember, this is the immune response. If you have a horse with a really robust immune system, he might be cranking out lots and lots of antibodies in response to this invader. That's a good thing. If he has no symptoms, then it's not in the spinal cord. He's not infected. If your horse has symptoms, even subtle symptoms or minor symptoms, then the higher the titer, the more likely the horse is to be infected. There's one big caveat here. And again, remember what the titer measures. The titer does not measure the protozoa. It measures the immune system's response to the protozoa. What if your horse has a weak immune system? So if the immune system is tired or it is busy with something else, it may not mount a strong titer. So the titer could be low. So your horse may be symptomatic with a pretty low titer. If your horse is co-infected with something else, and most typically this is Lyme disease, they also may have a low titer because the immune system is busy on two fronts, trying to deal with EPM and trying to deal with Lyme. So you may not see a robust titer to either, um, to, to, on either blood work. But if your horse has symptoms, then infection is likely, meaning it's very likely the protozoa have gotten into the spinal cord. And this is, of course, assuming you've ruled other things out. Just as a sidebar for you to bear in mind, what could cause a weak immune system? So number one on the list are nutritional deficits, especially long-term deficits in trace minerals. Horses need copper and zinc in particular to run almost every system in the body, but definitely their immune system. Pro-inflammatory diets, so diets that have ingredients that promote inflammation, these can be immunosuppressive. Chronic stress, if your horse has a busy hauling, showing, training schedule, is in the stall a lot and not out a lot and not out in social groups a lot, uh, or has other 
other things you can think of as chronic stressors like inadequately managed pain, these potentially can set the immune system up to not be able to cope very well. Gut inflammation ulcers, this is a huge issue in EPM. Almost every horse that I've consulted to has a history, perhaps distant, but has a history of having some kind of gut disorder. So remember the gut's the first line of defense against the protozoa. So a leaky gut wall, that's, that's not a good situation when the protozoa are trying to infiltrate. And the other big one that I see a lot are metabolic conditions. So a horse that's insulin resistant, for example, or has a pushing PPID, those horses often are at higher risk because their immune systems are, are simply not tuned up, not powerful. This is a cross-section of the spinal cord of a horse who is euthanized for EPM. And so what you can see is all those pink areas should not be there. This should be a creamy white cross-section without all those pink and red areas. Those areas are damage to the spinal cord. So, and again, just to reinforce this point, infection means damage because damage is what creates the symptoms. So here's an example of symptoms. This is a mare in her late 20s. She can only stand with her hind legs off to the right. That's the only way she knows where her hind legs are. Here's another example. This horse had very severe EPM. He is having trouble even standing. So in this photo, he has actually collapsed and he's trying to get himself back up. But notice how that hind leg is bent back under him. On the left, he's having a lot of trouble because he's got such hind end weakness. What kind of symptoms are we talking about? So what might you see? One of the complexities of diagnosing EPM is it has symptoms that can be very diverse. So one category of symptoms are postural abnormalities. The horse may stand with his or her feet in strange positions, so the feet may be spread way far apart from side to side, or they may be spread far apart um, going far back. So they may be too far forward or too far back, but the feet are not square and under the horse. So there isn't some oddity of where the foot positions are. That picture you just saw of the mare, she could only stand with her hind feet pushed far over to the right. The horse may not be able to stand straight or stand square. They may not be able to stand without leaning on something, on a fence, for example, or leaning up against a stall wall. And sometimes you see horses that have a head tilt, can't hold their head straight. Gait abnormalities are a very common symptom of EPM. You'll hear the word ataxia, meaning lack of coordination. So what that's, this means is that your horse is having trouble orchestrating the movements required with four legs to move in a smooth and coordinated way. These, these horses typically, they can't walk in a straight line. They may drift to one side or the other. They may tightrope walk, meaning they'll put their front feet or their back feet, or sometimes all four feet, very close together as they step, as though they're actually walking on a tightrope. They may constantly change their spacing between their feet. This is something I look for when I look at video of horses. So is the spacing consistent or uh, is it varying constantly with every step? They may look stiff and awkward. This is called spasticity. Gates may be disorganized. So if you're watching them, a, a healthy horse with an intact nervous system who's not in pain, and is not injured should flow as they move. So the walk should flow, the trot should flow, the canter should flow. With EPM, what happens is these gates start to get kind of disorganized and disjointed. And you'll, you can usually see it at the walk. It's as though the front and back legs aren't quite synchronized. They're not following in exactly the right timing. Sometimes at the trot, at the canter, most typically what you see is the horse is doing something called bunny hopping with the hind legs. So the hind legs come down together, not separately. So that, that bunny hop is, is very typical of EPM. Some horses will just be lame without any apparent cause. And you may have exhaustively researched and gone through lots of diagnostics and it's not clear why the horse is lame. And this could be that they simply are weak in some area because of EPM. Weakness is a big one. Usually one side's worse. Um, most of the horses that, that I've consulted to, the weakness is more right-sided than left-sided, but usually one side is worse. 
These horses will have, have trouble turning when you ask them to turn. They may have a hard time going up or downhill. They may tend to drift to one side or, or, or to the other or even trip or fall. They may be having a hard time getting up or down. And they often have great difficulty backing up. It's also possible to see body condition changes, muscle atrophy. So atrophy is muscle loss. Very typically, this is loss of top line and loss of hindquarters. And this may be asymmetrical. So you often see that one side of the hindquarters is smaller than the other side of the hindquarters. Some horses will show this up as full body muscle wasting. The, the entire body just looks like it, it has simply melted and the muscle mass is just gone. There are a whole list of other physical symptoms that are possible because the protozoa damages the nervous system. So anything the nervous system does is fair game for then becoming impaired. So facial paralysis, the horse's eyes, ears, or lips may droop. Sometimes you'll see a lower lip droop. They may not have a tail reflex. So when you go to manipulate the tail, they're unable to clamp their tail down. Or they may have impaired skin reflexes. They can't flick flies off anymore. Some horses have a hard time chewing. They may have trouble coordinating their tongue, or they may actually have trouble swallowing. Sometimes there are odd sweating patterns. In extreme cases where the protozoa have moved into the brain, there can be seizures, there can be vision loss, there can be hearing loss. Very often there are mood symptoms, and these are, these are not readily documented on a formal behavioral neuro exam, but this is where owner observation is very important because you will know if your horse is unusually anxious, is behaving in a fearful way, is spooking, particularly a horse who doesn't spook and hasn't had this pattern of behavior, or appears just dissociated, kind of spaced out, not there. What is causing these symptoms? Well, it's, it's damage. It's damage to the spinal cord. It's damage to the brain. And you can think about this from the horse's point of view. You know, there, there's four pieces here. One is, is to remember there are pathways. There are nerves that run from the brain to every part of the body. So if those are damaged, there's going to be difficulty controlling the body. With horses, most often what you see is they have difficulty controlling the legs and feet. There also are pathways that go from the body back to the brain. Those pathways also can be damaged. One of the primary jobs of those pathways is to tell the brain where the body is in space. Where are my feet? Where is my head? That, that uh, capacity is called proprioception. So when those pathways are damaged, there are proprioceptive deficits, meaning perception of where the body is in space is impaired. That's what the mare who was standing with her hind feet way off to the right was experiencing. That was the only way she knew where her feet were. The muscle wasting and the associated muscular weakness, this results from damaged nerves. So muscles depend on nerves firing normally to maintain their mass and strength. And when the nerves do not fire normally or when they don't fire at all, muscle fibers very quickly start to shrink. The mood changes are probably related to inflammation in the brain. So this would, of course, change how the horse perceives the world around him or her, and it might create anxious, spooky, or explosive behavior in a horse who isn't normally that way. There's another piece here, I believe, from just having worked with a lot of EPM horses, is that these horses know that they are not safe in their own bodies. They're prey animals, their safety depends on their ability to run if they need to run. And they know that they don't have their full capacity to keep themselves safe. So just that awareness, um, I believe, could certainly make a horse anxious or spooky. This is just a diagram very at a very uh, general level of the horse nervous systems. So you can see big pathways there, but if we did every nerve in the body, this would be a spider web because there's billions and billions of nerve endings in the horse body. But just for you to remember, and that green arrow there is an attempt to show you, there are pathways that go from the brain into every part of the body that gives the horse control over his body or her body. And the red arrows coming back up, these are the proprioceptive pathways. So they actually come from most of the joints and also from within the muscle tissue itself. They give the brain constant feedback 
about where the body is in space. So you can have damage to one or, or both, and that would make it very difficult to run your body. So what are the predictors of recovery? So how likely is your horse to fully recover from EPM? There's, you know, four I think that most people agree on, and then there's a fifth one that I've noticed. So one is the intensity of infection. So obviously if your horse has a massive protozoa load in the brain and spinal cord, then this is going to be harder than a horse who may have fewer. The, the, the thing about this, though, is you're not ever going to know. Remember, the titers do not measure the protozoa. They measure immune response. So you're not going to know that. So you just file that away. The duration of infection is very important. So the longer the horse has had the infection before being treated, the, the more time the protozoa have had, to do damage to the brain and spinal cord. This is particularly important if you have a horse who was not diagnosed for a long period, perhaps went years before someone thought to check for EPM. So this means there's a big backlog of damage. Can you fix these horses? You can, but it will take longer and it will take more. The location of the infection, your horse's symptoms tell you where this location is in the spinal cord and brain. In general, brain inflammation, seizures, vision loss, hearing loss, those things where the brain seems to be primarily affected rather than the spinal cord and motor control and proprioception are a little harder to shift, but not impossible. The presence of inflammation and other kinds of stressors is also very important in, in recovery. The more inflamed the horse is and the more stressed out the horse is, generally the more symptomatic the horse is. And this is also important if there are what with people we call comorbidities, if the horse has other conditions that aren't well controlled. So if they're if they're very insulin resistant or have Cushing PPID or they have a co-infection like Lyme and that's not being addressed, then it's going to be a, a longer road to recovery for this horse. A fifth one that I've observed in working with EPM horses is the age and the size of the horse matter in a general sense. So the older the horse, you know, the harder it is in some ways to leverage complete recovery because you just have an older body. You have less physiological resilience. They do recover, but they may take longer and they may take more. Also, the size of the horse, bigger horses have more nervous system. So if you have more nerves you've got to fix or longer nerves you've got to fix, this can take longer. So from a recovery perspective, the harder cases, you know, the hardest case would be, let's say, a 22-year-old draft horse who went undiagnosed for two years. That's a hard case. It's not impossible, but it does require being very persistent with um, the steps required to support the horse's body not just to clear the infection, but to repair all the damage that's left behind. So how is EPM treated? There are three FDA approved medications. I think of them in two categories. One is the direct antiprotozoals, that is drugs that act directly on the protozoa. These are brand names Marquis and Protozoal. Uh, the generic or the compounded versions are Panazoril for Marquis and Diclazoril for protozo Protozoal. These directly inhibit protozoa replication and they interfere with the protozoa's metabolism. So the net result of this is a relatively rapid reduction in protozoa load, the number of protozoa in the nervous system. There is also a third FDA approved medication called Rebalance. This is an indirect antiprotozoal. It interferes with folic acid synthesis, so with B vitamin utilization. This also reduces the protozoa load, but it takes much, much longer. So just to be aware, these are data from FDA trials that rebalance is the least effective. It's the most toxic and it, it takes the longest. It can take up to nine months. Rebalance is a blend of two, uh, two antibiotics, pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. So the evidence for what I've just said about these three drugs comes from the data submitted to the FDA as part of the FDA approval process, which are publicly available data. And I have some references at the end of the presentation, but you can find these data and look at them yourself. And there are also numerous published papers on these medications. So there is a body of evidence. There are other medications that are used for EPM. 
Tiltrazoril, and this is often given with DMSO, which is a sulfur-based anti-inflammatory, uh, is metabolized to panazoril, which is marquee. So tiltrazoril is one step away from being panazoril or marquee. There is substantial evidence about the efficacy of tiltrazoril, its ability to penetrate the spinal cord, and the fact that it does kill the protozoa. So there's many published papers. There is another medication called Origin, which is decoquinate with levomisole. The evidence for the efficacy of that drug combination is extremely limited. There also are many alternative approaches, and if you've Googled, you will find these. There are various combinations of herbs and homeopathy. The evidence for these approaches working is very dependent on which company's formulation it is. So in general, it's quite limited. There are a few exceptions with companies that do keep databases of efficacy. So there are a few that have documented that they do work, but for the most part, there really is no evidence for these. How long should you treat your horse? The direct antiprotozoa, so marquee and protozoa, or if you're using compounded or generic versions, panazoril or diclazoril. In the FDA trials, those trials with those meds only went for 28 days. So sometimes you see the 28-day treatment course is what's recommended. Many vets, however, will treat for 60 to 90 days if symptoms are more than relatively minor or if the horse appears to have been infected for a long time. Tiltrazoril is sort of the same, same rule of thumb, somewhere between 30 to 90 days. At 90 days, because these work by inhibiting replication and interfering with metabolism, really once you hit the 60 to 90 day window, there are very unlikely to be any protozoa left. The indirect antiprotozoal rebalance, this one took the longest. So in the FDA trial data, it took up to nine months to actually clear the protozoa. Other medications, we don't have a published uh, record or a published database, so I'd say nobody knows. Let's talk about treatment success. So if you look in the lower right-hand corner of this slide, in, in brackets there, so what do owners mean by treatment success? You mean your horse is back to normal. You mean your horse can be ridden, can compete if that's what she was doing. Mood is normal. You can enjoy your horse again. There's no falling. There's no stumbling. If your horse was a retired elder, that that horse is now safe in his or her body, safe out in the pasture, safe in the stall. That's what you mean. Horse is normal. That's not how success is defined in drug trials of these medications. This is another critically important point to bear in mind. In the drug trials for the FDA approved meds, success was defined as the improvement of one neurological grade on a six point scale. So the scale there that was used across trials is there on the left, the neurologic grading scale. So zero is, is normal or seems completely fine. And it goes up to five, a horse who's a grade five can't get up. So very, very severe symptoms. So, so you take a sec and just take a look at those and understand that when the efficacy of medications is discussed, what is meant that a success is improvement of one neurological grade. So if a horse went into the study as a grade three and came out of the study as a grade two, that horse was counted as a success. Not what you mean by success, but that's how success was defined. Why does that matter? Because you will hear the numbers 60%. Marquis is 60% effective. Protozoa is about 60% effective. You will think that means, okay, 60% of the horses treated with marquee return to normal. That's not what that means. 60% of the horses treated with marquee improved by one neurological grade. About 60% of the horses treated with protozoa improved by one neurological grade. You'll notice in parentheses I have numbers that say verified. So in the FDA data, 
there were videotapes of the horses who went through the trials and the videos were sent to a different set of vets who were not involved in the trial. And they were asked to verify, did they agree this horse improved by one neurological grade? So the verified numbers in both cases are much lower. So what this means is when a second set of eyes took a look at what the horse was doing, fewer vets agreed they were better. So just bear that in mind. But this is where that 60% comes from that you often hear. And again, 60% improved by one neurological grade. 60% did not return to normal. With rebalance, it's even lower. It took, you know, it took much longer. It works differently. It's a different kind of medication. So more like 42% improved by one grade. Um, and you know, only about a third were, were verified successes. Here's the thing you have to remember. This is a, another key point about EPM medications. In the FDA trial data, which are the most extensive data we have, this involves several hundred horses, none of those horses, not one, was neurologically normal at the end of treatment. Not one. Not even horses who had negative blood and CSF titers because these horses were all evaluated periodically with blood and CSF. So you have zero protozoa in your antibodies in your blood. You have zero protozoa antibodies in your CSF. Protozoa are gone. Still not normal. Still not normal. Okay, hold that for a sec. So again, why? How can these horses go through treatment and not be normal at the other end? So Treatment does not equal normal function. Medications that stop the protozoa from replicating and interfere with their metabolism, so all the meds we've talked about, that's what they do. Their job is to interact with the protozoa and shut them down, but they do not repair the spinal cord damage left behind. This is the most frequently misunderstood point about treating and rehabbing EPM horses. So separate this in your mind. The meds, whatever you choose to use, their job is to shut the protozoa down, but they will not repair the spinal cord. They do not have that capacity. This is why treatment does not automatically return your horse to 100% normal. Some horses will recover over time, but many do not. Many are not ever the same again, neurologically. So what do you do about that? This is where equine nutrition comes in, and this is where I got interested and then involved with EPM horses, because there's a ton we can do to support the nervous system to heal. While the meds are dealing with the protozoa, we can support the body to start fixing itself. Horses are some of the most resilient creatures in the world. I mean, they're unbelievable in their capacity to fix themselves. So some principles here that I use as a nutritionist, one is inflammation is your enemy. So anything that pushes up inflammation is gonna block healing and it's gonna make symptoms worse. So inflammation is a very common trigger of exacerbated symptoms, of worsened symptoms. So one piece of this approach is an anti-inflammatory diet. Take everything out of the diet that we know has pro-inflammatory aspects to it. Soy, corn, wheat millings, sweet feed, excess molasses. Get toxins out of the feed bucket. Soy in this country is virtually all GMO, and if it's GMO soy, it's been sprayed with Roundup, and if you send a sample of that feed to a lab, there will be a measurable Roundup residue. Your horse doesn't need pesticides right now to cope with. Bee pulp is a lovely food in lots of ways, but it's all contaminated with aluminum because of the sugar beet processing, so get that out of the feed bucket. What you're aiming for is a very high omega-3 based diet, anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids, and relatively low omega-6s, which are pro-inflammatory. When you clean the diet up, before you do anything else, some horses will improve by one neurological grade just, just from this shift, just from taking the inflammation and the toxins out of the feed bucket. So how do we specifically restore neurological function? So there's two components to this. The first one is what I call working from the inside out. So what can we give the horse to fortify that horse to start to fix their bodies, whatever EPM has done to them, to start to restore that horse to full function? 
So this is a custom protocol that takes into account who this horse is, you know, is the, what age is this horse, what breed, what other medical history is involved, how bad are the symptoms, and what's the time period over which these symptoms unfold. Those are all important components. The, the components of the, the protocol are nutraceuticals or specific nutrients or herbs in some cases that have a combination of effects. One is they stimulate the release of nerve growth factor. This is the cue to the nervous system to fix itself, to regrow neurons, to start rewiring the nervous system. They also control inflammation in the nervous system because this will interfere with healing and it will make symptoms worse. The immune system needs to be supported as well as the gut, you know, because so much of immune function starts there. And liver and kidneys need to be in good working order. This also involves antioxidants, vitamin E, although there's very little evidence that vitamin E helps horses who have EPM. Nevertheless, we can throw some E in the mix. Also some vitamin C, some pycnogenol, CoQ10, depends on the horse. Uh, sometimes a cocktail of antioxidants is really helpful. When you use this approach customized to the horse, so the approach is tailored to match what this specific horse needs, in my experience, more than 90% of horses will regain their full function. The other piece to this is restoring neurological function from the outside in. So what can you do with your horse to support improve coordination, improve balance. And so there, there are exercises that can be used to strengthen muscles that have become weak. There are strategies to improve proprioception. So the awareness of where the body is in space. This can be specific kinds of movements, balance pads. If you've ever seen the Murdoch pads, that's a great example of that. And there are wearable proprioceptive enhancement systems. I like the Eagle Pro 6 for this because it's very comfortable. It can be worn for long periods. A horse can wear it, you know, for 12 hours a day out on turnout and basically be rehabbing herself. It also encourages balanced body use. So that's the outside in. So working from the inside out, we're feeding to support nervous system repairs and restoration. Working from the outside in, we're strategizing around helping the horse regain complete control of his or her body. These are just a few examples. This horse had a classic right-sided atrophy of the hindquarters that was restored after treatment and after um, neurological support protocol using various nutraceuticals. This mare had very severe wasting. You can see at the top picture how thin she is, how her spine is showing, her hip bones are showing, her shoulders are protruding. And this is only six days. This is mostly just the diet change. You know, her body already started to bounce back. This mare, I showed you this picture before, she straightened up considerably. She did even get a little bit straighter than that. I, I can't remember when that picture was, maybe 60 days into rehab. And she was also an older mare, so she's in her mid to late 20s. So it takes a little longer, but she got there. What about recovery? Okay. How do you think about recovery with EPM? Another very commonly misunderstood point. The mantra here is chase function. Do not chase titers. Do not. And I'll explain to you why. Function. The best indicators of recovery in your horse is a return to normal balance, coordination, and movement. A return to normal mood and affect. A return to normal body condition. In other words, when you look at your horse, if you say, yeah, he's back. Yeah, she's back. That is recovery. The problem with titers Protozoa titers do not behave like other kinds of titers. And if you if you pull a titer for Lyme disease, let's say the Cornell multiplex, and your horse has Lyme disease and you treat, and then after a few months after treatment, you pull another titer to check, that titer will have gone down if treatment was effective. So that's helpful with Lyme. Protozoa titers do not behave like that. They can remain elevated for months or years when the horse still appears to be normal. So why, why does that happen? Remember why titers go up. Remember why titers go up. If your horse is in the same environment in which he or she originally became infected, it's very likely your horse 
is constantly re-exposed. So if your horse is re-exposed to the protozoa, you may be in the middle of treatment, the horse takes a big mouthful of possum droppings, more protozoa hit the gut wall, this horse is going to crank antibodies out. So if you, if you measure a titer, particularly in the blood at that point, you say, guys, titer is still really high. So titers for, for protozoa are not a good indicator of where the horse is in terms of infection because of this distinction between exposure versus infection. Also, remember, titers do not predict function. In the FDA data, even the horses with zero titers weren't normal. So don't pay attention to the titer. Function is what matters. Function indexes recovery far more reliably in titers. If you chase titers, you'll be driven crazy, honestly. Function, chase Finally, let's talk about the dreaded scenario of relapse. You hear people say, my, my EPM horse has had a relapse. So, so what, what is meant by that? So owners mean symptoms returned. Whatever was going on during EPM has now seen, appears to have come back. A couple of things that are important to understand this. First of all, your horse is a master of compensation. As a prey animal, their survival depends on their ability to stand, to move, to function in their environment. And they are incredibly capable of hiding symptoms and especially subtle symptoms, subtle weakness symptoms, subtle neurological symptoms. So what can happen is, especially if you have an athletic horse or a younger horse, you get into treatment and rehab, nutritional rehab, horse seems fine. You are back doing what you were doing before. You're, you're jumping or you're trail riding or you're, whatever it is uh, you were doing with your horse. The horse seems like he feels great. She's doing all the things she used to be able to do. Her affect's normal, body condition looks good. You think this whole thing has gone into the rearview mirror and then something happens and a symptom reappears. So what is this? It's very likely that anything that triggers inflammation also can reveal unresolved nervous system damage. So if your horse was hiding that small percentage of unfixed nervous system damage, an inflammatory flare will reveal it. One of the most common is a weather change. So the, the weather suddenly gets very, very hot or very, very cold or swings back and forth between hot and cold. That can provoke the sudden reappearance of symptoms. Another one can be vaccines, particularly uh, multiple vaccines. So a four-way, five-way, six-way or a stressor such as hauling or showing. So the horse seems fine. You go to the show, you do fine. You come back, horse gets off the trailer, and you notice that you know she's dragging her right hind toe again. Okay, so what's happened? So again, the most likely explanation here is that inflammation has risen enough to, to reveal some unresolved damage. But what, what owners dread is not just the unresolved damage, but is my horse, is my horse reinfected? And this is very hard to know because as, as we've talked about several times through this presentation, titers are not really a good predictor of function. Bear in mind that if your horse is in the environment where they were originally exposed to EPM and became infected and you have possums around, then your horse is constantly re-exposed. So, Every time your horse takes a mouthful of possum droppings and the protozoa hit the gut wall, your horse will start to crank out antibodies again. So you, if you took a titer at this point, maybe you're midway through treatment and the horse looks fabulous. You may even see the titer has gone up. Well, why is it doing this? A blood titer. Why is it doing this? Well, if the horse has been re-exposed, its titer is going to go up. But remember that exposure doesn't necessarily mean infection. So the fact that your horse may be re-exposed doesn't mean necessarily has a whole new infection. You've got to go back through all of that again. The difficulty is it's, it's really hard to pull apart these two scenarios. Is this all just unresolved damage 
or is there the possibility of reinfection? Could he, could the protozoa have gotten into him and not just in the gut, but have gotten through the blood brain barrier again and now be back in the brain and spinal cord? It's very hard to know. And you can have both scenarios going on at the same time. So it can be there's some unresolved damage that you're now seeing in response to a stressor or a pro-inflammatory event. And it also can be that your horse not only got re-exposed, but did indeed get reinfected. When in doubt, um, treat again. It's the simplest thing to do, treat again. The other thing is continue the nervous system support, particularly if symptoms return suddenly without any kind of precursor, it's very likely that this is just unhealed damage. So continuing to support the nervous system will help the horse to move through that episode and, and return to how they were before, looking 100%. Questions. That's my website, foroaksequine.com. My email is foroaksconsulting at gmail.com if you have questions. Do you need help? If you need help, please take pictures of your horse from both sides and from the back. Please take video of your horse walking forward and backing up slowly in hand, not under saddle, in hand, so on a, on a lead rope, halter and lead rope. The fastest way to get a connection with me is through my Facebook Messenger account that you see there. You can send to my email as well, but that's a bit slower. Thank you for your patience throughout this presentation. I hope you learned some valuable information and please do reach out if you have questions, if you need clarifications, or of course, if you need help. This slide has the references on it, specifically the references for the drug data, the FDA approved drug data. These data are publicly available on the FDA site. They're also available on each manufacturer's website. So they are called new animal drug applications, but the data I reported to you are in those documents. There's also an excellent scientific review article by Duby et al, uh, dated 2015, that is state of the art in terms of what do we know about EPM currently, everything about the organism's life cycle, what it does in the horse, and some of the information I mentioned about drugs and titers also is reviewed there.